What's up, nerds? I mean that with the utmost respect. I've really been wondering if I should make this video because the science content on YouTube is mostly popular science and this is real science. Anyway, let's dive in, shall we? What I'm going to present to you today is the exact presentation that I, uh, I made for my public lecture uh, as a part of my examination when I finished my master's degree in computational physics. So it's going to be a bit th uh, technical, I think, but uh, I've tried to, to make it as accessible to, to everyone. So if you're a bachelor student in, in physics, I think you will, able to, you will be able to catch most of it. So here we are, this is the title, Aqueduct Ab Initio Quantum Dynamics Using Couple Cluster in Time. And I made this real, very fancy title in order to make this nice acronym. Ab Initio methods are a group of methods that uh, Ab Initio means from first principles. So you make as few assumptions on your quantum mechanical systems as possible. You would basically just tell the computer, here are the rules of uh, quantum and quantum mechanics. How does nature look like? And the uh, couple cluster method is one of those such methods. So this is my agenda for my little talk for you all here. First, I want to motivate the need for these specialized quantum many, many body methods. And uh, then I will outline uh, the time dependent couple cluster method. And I will talk a little bit about what uh, myself and my my partner in despair uh, has built for the for the last year and a half approximately, and uh, then I will show you some some sweet nice results from using these uh, these tools. So let's go. So the equation here at the top, as you you may recognize as the Schrödinger equation, it's the equation that I've been attempting to solve for three years now, I, I think. Um, I hope most of you know it. They, uh, the, if you separate it into uh, temporal or time-dependent uh, variables and, uh, s and spatial variables, it, you will also find that it has stationary solutions or time-independent solutions, which satisfies what we call the, the time-independent Schrodinger equation, the equation in the middle. And uh, you will also need some Hamiltonian which defines the quantum system that you're looking at. I hope most of these uh, things are familiar to you all. So we could start with, say, the simplest Hamiltonian in uh, quantum chemistry, the Hamiltonian for the hydrogen atom, where we see that we have one a kinetic uh, term here and a, uh, a potential. Most uh, bachelor students or um, undergraduate students in quantum mechanics, they, they are in physics, they solve the hydrogen atom. As you might remember, but let me remind you, it involves separation of variable in three, three times, I believe, where we get the spherical harmonics as your, your eigenstates and so on. So anyway, let's move on to the helium atom. And what's interesting about the helium atom is that it contains two hydrogenetic or hydrogenic, is that what you say? Hydrogen-like Hamilton, Hamiltonian pieces. And it also has these, uh, this um, third term, a third part, which is the Coulomb interaction between the electrons. And this will be problematic. You can choose to simply ignore this term and you will be able to solve the equation again by separation of variables and you will get the ground state energy of something like this, but it will be very wrong because experiment shows that this is the real ground state energy. So, and here I would like to mention Egil Hylleros, a Norwegian uh, physicist or and chemist, I think. And he managed to solve the, the the helium atom or compute the ground state of the helium atom analytically very precisely in 1929, and he did so using a mechanical desk calculator. And I have one of these. I really want to show you. So this is a mechanical uh, calculator. It has a crank and everything. It's really neat. My godfather, he's an antique dealer. He gave this to me. It's uh, it's a really nice conception. I. I like it, but I have no idea how, how would one would uh, go about solving the helium atom on it. Uh, you can see Hildos' uh, machine here on on his desk, and uh, if you like, you could try to understand what uh, Egil Hildos did in his uh, article in German. 
Anyways, there are several of these many body methods, and uh, Egelhuder has also used one. I am not exactly sure which, but um, it, it was approximative, it was not exact. Probably the most famous method that most chemists, at least, has, uh, have heard about is the Hartree. Uh, I'm, I'm anxious to pronounce the name of this method because this video will probably not be well appreciated by the YouTube algorithm. Anyway, here goes the Hartree Fock method, developed by Douglas Hartree and Vladimir Fock. Uh, it's not very accurate, but it's quite fast, computationally cheap. You have density functional theory, and uh, the density functional theory, instead of trying to look at the system as a wave function uh, with positions, it looks at the the, dense, the electron number density of the system instead, and it's it's very popular, especially in solid state physics. Similarly to the Hartree-Fock method, what what the methods really do is that they they're they're mean field theories really. So they the interaction interaction one electron has with the other electrons will be averaged out as in a mean field. Uh, you have a arguably exactly precise method called the full configuration interaction. I will get back to that later, but it's unfeasible to try to compute anything with it because it's so expensive. You have many body, you have a many body version of perturbation theory. It works quite well, and if you do a very, if you do the perturbation expansion in a clever way, you will end up with the method that we have um, been using, the coupled cluster method. So let's go. Firstly, very briefly about Hartree Fock method because that's usually your vantage point. Uh, it has some assumptions. All many body methods actually assume that the nuclei. Uh, if you're de dealing with atoms or molecules are at rest. This is called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And what it does is that it um, finds the solution in the variationally by assuming a linear combination of a hopefully complete basis set, which is usually non-orthogonal. So these basis set, especially in chemistry, they are very, very uh, specialized. And the ground state in the Hartree-Fock method is approximated by a single slater determinant. You can look up what a Slater determinant is, but very briefly, it is a very good uh, many-body approximation of a anti, an anti-symmetric wave function. So it models fermions or electrons, which is what we are interesting, interested in in this study. Uh, regrettably, it uh, is a mean field uh, method, so it will ignore any many-body effects or electron correlation, as we call them. And this is uh, this constraint is what we will try to uh, to loosen. So uh, hopefully it'll get better. And because I'm doing a bit of a history lesson here as well, here we see all the way to the right in the picture Douglas Hartree together with two mates at uh, the University of Cambridge, I think, where they have built a differential analyzer out of uh, Meccano, the the toy. So how do we treat electron correlation? What we could do is to perform a configuration interaction expansion. We try to represent the exact wave function psi all the way over here uh, with the Hartree-Fock ground state and uh, a sum of uh, all other excited uh, Slater determinants. So one of these phi's is a Slater determinant and this is singly excited because it has two of these index, indices, and this is uh, doubly excited, so you can keep going like this. And uh, these Cs, they are coefficient matrices. So these are what you're trying to find, and you, you want contributions from all kinds. In, a, uh, in an atom, usually 90% of your system is, can be modeled by a, a Hartree-Fock, uh, or 90 plus, so it's very good by Hartree-Fock ground state, but you get some more stuff here, and usually a lot of stuff here. If you include all such terms, you will get the full configuration interaction, which I have already mentioned. And it would, um, within the limit of your basis set, give you an exact solution to your problem. And you need to solve this generalized eigenvalue uh, problem where the Cs, they are the um, the coefficient matrices, and uh, S is an overlap matrix between the different uh, basis uh, functions, or the single particle functions, and the age is the uh, matrix representation of your Hamiltonian. Uh, this is expensive. It's uh, almost impossible to do. I think one of the largest systems ever done is the nitrogen uh, molecule consisting of two 
nitrogen molecules with 14 electrons. I, I usually don't memorize all these things, but and that was on a very, very large supercomputer in uh, Holland or Belgium, I think. So, could we simply truncate the CI expansion? And by that I mean, could we just stop here, say? And the problem with that is that the truncated uh, configuration interaction is not size consistent and size extensive. And, and what that means is that the results that you get from your uh, your model would not uh, scale properly as you increase the size of the system. It's very problematic. So you get more and more wrong, the bigger your your system uh, gets. So this is something we need to deal about, which leads us to the couple cluster method. All right. So why do we use couple cluster? Well. Firstly, it loosens the Hartree-Fox mean field constraint and accounts for electron correlation in a very nice way. It is very accurate for um, small to medium sized systems. So as the exact co full configuration interaction method could only look at very small systems, now we can look at some larger systems. And uh, it is very much, it, it's computationally cheaper than the configuration interaction method. And perhaps best of all, it is both size extensive and size consistent. Bear in mind that what they mean is that your model will scale properly with the size of the system. So let's start uh, looking at how the, um, the couple cluster method is, is built up. So it assumes an exponential form wave function. And this form stems from doing a Rayleigh-Schrodinger many-body perturbation expansion and then realizing that some terms cancel and you will be left with what we already call fully linked terms or linked diagrams. I won't get into that either because it's very complicated, but you will get this very neat expression as an exponential function with the cluster operator. And this exponential function will of course be expanded in the usual manner like so. The cluster operator T contains different terms for each excitation level. So it's very it's very similar to the, the configuration interaction expansion. So the first one, T1, the first part of the cluster operator, will contain a, two, a pair of second quantized operators. So that comprises a single excitation. The second uh, cluster operator, T2, will contain two pairs of uh, second quantized operators. If you're not used to these, you can uh, think of them almost like ladder operators in the um, uh, a harmonic uh, oscillator problem. And here is the, the general uh, T, T, M, which has M pairs of second quantized operators. And what you're trying to find are these Greek T's, the taus, which will give you coefficients uh, for a special, you pick a special combination from your reference state. This is the reference state. Yeah, so you could easily truncate this method and it will be, would become the couple cluster singles doubles method for instance if you only kept the T1 couple cluster operator and the T2 cluster operator uh, because then you would have included single excitations as we call them and double excitations. Uh, and in this case the couple cluster wave function would be simply, well with this, this expression you might notice that you have the T this tau is in the T2s, right? Here and here and so on. And this guy is within this. So here you see how you actually pick certain parts of your reference state, this, this bit, to represent this bit. In the, the couple cluster uh, scheme, we compute the uh, energy in this uh, manner. This is what we call a similarity transform the Hamiltonian to, um, to compute the uh, energy. And uh, you also have the um, amplitude equations. So these are the equation that you actually solve to find your, your different uh, tau values. This must be zero. Um, so in the um, couple cluster doubles case, if we only include the T2 operator, you would um, need to solve this couple cluster doubles amplitude equation in order to find the, the T's, the tau's. We call the tau's the amplitudes. That's a very important term. Okay, so that was very briefly the ground state version of couple cluster. Now we move on to the time dependent 
domain or time dependent couple cluster method. All right. I hope you're bearing with me. So the time dependent method starts with a problem within the couple cluster realm. And that is that it, it is non-variational and that means that the energy is not bounded, which is very problematic. So what we do, or what Trygve Helgakir, another Norwegian chemist actually, uh, did, is he reformulated the method in a Lagrangian formalism, which means that he uh, took the unbounded energy optimization problem and said that, hey, we have some, um, some boundary conditions here, the amplitude equations that I just showed you on the previous uh, slide. And he formulated this um, uh, Lagrangian. So here, this is the couple cluster energy. Energy. And this, these are the, um, whoop, the amplitude equations. So these, the, these are the equations where we found find the the taus, all right. And they're somewhat rewritten with a. Um, relaxation uh, operator and we've added the Lagrange multipliers here you see. So if we if we put all the Lagrange multipliers into this uh, capital uh, lambda we get this very neat e expression down here. All right I won't linger too much there and this is fairly equivalent with what um, Joku Arponen uh, called the bivariational principle where he actually reformulated the couple cluster method in a specialized version of the variational principle where he varied the, the ket and the bra side of the wave function uh, at the same time and if you pick uh, a special parametrization like this you see that it's, it's the same and this bivariational principle will generalize in time. Here are some equations and you could define a an action like functional like this or an in integral and uh, you will find stationary conditions so here we have actually you will recognize the amplitudes but now we also have a second set of amplitudes the Lagrange, Lagrange multiplier variables. So these equations would dictate that how the amplitude of a coupled cluster wave function would develop in time. Then you are not actually developing the uh, reference state which is what you're basing your coupled cluster wave function on but you are developing what you pick from your reference state. So this is actually a fairly good estimate. So these equations, they, they say that, hey, just uh, solve these equation of motions and then you can develop your, your amplitudes in time. You could also develop the orbitals or the single particle function within your reference state in time. Then it gets more uh, diff difficult. You get a uh, new energy functional. This is what I mean by more difficult. You have a new set of uh, equation of motions for the amplitudes but in addition you have these orbital equations which you can solve in order to develop the uh, the amplitudes in time and I won't explain these either just know that they're there you can go look up um, Simon Qualls article from 2012 where everything is explained all right so your main take back if you didn't really catch anything of this and I it is very understandable if you did because I went through it incredibly quickly what you need to know is that in the couple cluster method you solve for the amplitude, the taus and the lambdas in order to model your exact wave function or hopefully a, a better wave function from a reference state it was a phi. Like we had the phi and we had a bunch of stuff and then we had a psi, right? If you want to develop your system in time you can develop just the amplitudes or you could develop your orbitals in addition to the amplitude. So there are two time dependent methods and we have implemented both methods up to the double excitation level. So what have you done? We have two models for Python and we hope to make these available well to the public eventually. Uh, they're called quantum systems which defines different quantum systems and couple cluster which is the couple cluster solvers and it contains both ground state solvers and time dependent solvers. And uh, in the quantum systems uh, module, we have um, what we do is we set up basis sets defining different quantum systems, and uh, we have um, implemented a bunch of quantum dot systems, which has been my main focus of uh, study. But also, uh, we have made interfaces to popular quantum uh, chemistry modules for Python, Pi SCF, and Psi4, so you can just uh, pull down whatever basis sets you need. It kind of looks like uh, this this is the class uh, hierarchy this is a little messy so I'll just 
mask out uh, the less important bits and just show you that, okay, uh, what you need in order to solve something, you need to have a um, quantum system. And if you want to make it time independent, you need a time uh, evolution operator. You put your quantum system into a couple cluster method and you have all these uh, subclasses here. If you want to solve uh, the ground state uh, problem, or you could make the quantum system available to, or a quantum system object available to a time dependent couple cluster method and propagate it in time. If you do so, you also need an integrator. So we have we implemented a few integrators, normal uh, Rangakata and a uh, symplectic integrator. Uh, I have uh, provided a very brief example of, uh, of how you, one would uh, write a, a minimum viable script to solve a simple system. So here we go. First on the top we have some simple uh, imports, but we import from our quantum systems uh, uh, library as well. Here we have imported a ODQD class, that's the one dimensional quantum dot, and we import a special potential, the harmonic oscillator potential, and we also import a laser field which will be our um, time dependent uh, term which we add to the Hamiltonian of the system. And we also import a couple cluster methods in this um, here we have imported the orbital adaptive time dependent couple cluster doubles method, uh, which is a method where we do both time development of the amplitudes and the orbitals. And we import our symplectic integrator, the Gauss integrator. Next we have a laser pulse, and here we define some oscillating uh, pulse. Uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff here, most, most of these things are parameters, but we implement the call method of this class, and you'll notice that we have some, some signs here. Uh, and uh, those define the, um, the the frequency of the f of the field and also the the uh, the envelope of the of the pulse. So we will have an increasing amplitude and then it would decrease again, uh, which is this uh, sine squared term here. And we also have a heavy side function which which will make it shut down after some some time. And we also need to define a system. Here we have. A system with two electrons and 12 uh, basis spin orbitals. So that, that's the size of our basis set. And we have all these methods. We define time dependent harmonic oscillator from the one dimensional quantum dot. We set up the system with a harmonic oscillator potential here. And we change to a Hartree Fock basis to find a good reference state. So this is actually a Hartree Fock solver as well. And then we add the time evolution operator, which is our laser from this is this guy and we also add a, uh, a polarization vector to make the, the field complete the, ele the electric field. And then we add our uh, solver. We make a class instance of the orbital adaptive time dependent couple cluster doubles method. We set up the initial conditions. That's a mess. We, we made it so that you can pick your initial conditions. But what it will do if we don't provide any arguments is simply supply the, uh, the ground state solution that we solved when we define the system or the uh, artifact uh, basis. Oh, oh, yeah. And then we compute the couple cluster ground state as well, which will um, make the ground state solution a little bit better. And then we do some time development. It's quite easy. We just, it's a, just a simple for, for loop where we call the um, solve method of our solver class and we uh, extract the energies of the systems. And uh, then we do some plotting. It would look something like this. This is uh, sped up tremendously. It will be over quick. We have a progress bar and and it's done. And this is what we get. So here is our laser pulse. Uh, you see that it's an oscillating um, thing. It's very, very simple. It doesn't have time to oscillate a lot, but you see that the amplitude is increasing and then it decreases again. And uh, because this um, this laser field has a frequency which is resonant to our system. We see that the uh, the energy of the system increases throughout the, the time that we shot at the system with the laser. So we excite the system. Quite interesting. And now for some results. So these are all results that we have uh, arrived at with our methods. First, some, some benchmarks. This is from Lee et al. in 2005. We have uh, computed the instantaneous dipole moment of a hydrogen molecule. Lee and friends, they, they use the time-dependent Hartree-Fock method. So that's the, that's the graph down here. And we have uh, implemented one time-dependent couple cluster single doubles method, which is um, where we 
only develop the amplitudes and the orbital adaptive method where we develop the amplitude in time as well and we see that they give the same results which is what we what we wanted so this is a this is a nice benchmark in this study this was initially done by Miyagi and Matson in 2013 uh, they tried to model the ionization of beryllium so in all these studies what they do is they um, they act on the system with some sort of oscillating field in the way that we just did in my, my very simple example. Uh, and in this study they have a fairly strong laser or in intense laser which should be able to ionize uh, at the beryllium atom. And how they model this is they look at the particle density of the system at three points in time before the simulation starts, halfway through and through at the end. And uh, we did the same thing with our two methods, the, the, the method with static orbitals, where we only develop the amplitudes, and the one where we have adaptive orbitals in time as well. And as you see, they are in complete, uh, complete agreement, of course. This is the ground state before we start. So the, the nu nucleus is somewhere here. And uh, this uh, thing is halfway through and here we see some uh, discrepancies, which we would expect. And here we see that the static orbital method is really struggling because it just goes like pop, 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 up and down. So, uh, and you won't see the entire graph, but it, it gives some very high values. So, so this is a case where the static orbital method, the less advanced method, it is, is worse. Uh, and the orbital adaptive method is very good. Uh, and the reason that the static orbital method is very bad in this case is that as we keep subjecting the system to this uh, laser field uh, over a, a long period of time, uh, you will move further and far, farther and farther away from your reference state. And as you remember, when we compute the ground state in a couple cluster scheme, we pick from our reference uh, state. And uh, what, what the method that only develops the amplitudes does is try to pick new things from the reference state to uh, model or represent the new system. And it gets, it, th that becomes very, very difficult. It tries it best, it, it, best. it, it doesn't, the, the program doesn't shut down, it doesn't break down, but the uh, results are unreasonable. And the reason that the orbital adaptive method is good is because as you progress through time, even though you move far from where you've begun, you adapt your, your uh, you make a new reference state at each point in time. And here you see the amplitudes of the, uh, the static orbital method and it gets very erratic and the values get very big. So this is also a testimony to why it's bad. Yeah, and if you would try to compute a ground state probability with this method, you would have some very unreasonable values here. We have 300 probability, with it's unreasonable. In, in special cases, where you subject the system to a strong laser for a long amount of time, you will pull the system apart, essentially, and uh, you will not do with the, the simplest time-dependent method where you keep the orbital static. And now over to quantum dots, which has been my main area of study. First, we computed some time-dependent ground state probability studies of one-dimensional quantum dots. And these uh, simulations, they are for different size, uh, systems of different size. So uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 and 12 electrons, which is a lot. And we see that as the system increases, when we have subjected to a, a, a laser field, we see that for the larger system, more stuff is going on really. In that, um, in the sense that, well, there's less probability of being in the ground state, which is interesting in itself. A nice result. And uh, what we've also do, do done, we, we did this for all uh, systems of all different sizes. We moved to two dimensions and we tried to to vary the frequency of the of the laser field. The um, which we should subject the system uh, to. So here you see all the different sequences, one and up to uh, two in increments of uh, 0 0.25. The resonant frequency of the system in this case is, is one, one uh, AU frequency units, all right? And you see that when we compute this, this ground state uh, probability, say, or the overlap with the ground state, is that um, when we pick a frequency that is resonant with the system, we have vastly lower 
probability of finding the the, the system in the ground state after the simulation is over. So you see where the, where the frequency is far from the resonant uh, frequency, we, um, uh, it, well, we we're still in the ground state really, because we're not really able to do anything. It's like, this is um, comparable to trying to push a swing. You know that you should, you know, push it in the same frequency as it swings, you know, okay, when it's going away from me, I'm pushing away. Well, so, so this is a bit intuitive, that's that's my point. You see the same tendency in, um, in the energy of the system. You are able to excite when you are close to the resonant frequency of the system. When you're far away, nothing happens. And the same, the same holds true for six electrons as well in a harmonic oscillator potential. So I think these are these are very interesting. My super advisor as well, he told me that he hadn't really seen simulation like this, which is kind of neat. And then I want to talk about the harmonic potential theorem. It can be proven analytically that if you were to to measure the uh, the energy of a quantum dot in a uh, in a laboratory, or say you have a quantum dot, you put a bunch of electrons in, you will you will see the same frequency of the systems no matter how many electrons you put into it, which is a bit strange. At the same time. It is reasonable because if you remember when you, if, if you have done a quantum harmonic oscillator in your undergraduate um, quantum mechanics course, you know that the, the energy transitions between all the levels there are the same no matter what. Still, you would think that you would see some sort of many particle system, now many particle effect. So if you put more electrons in, you would see some, maybe some richer spectrum in, in the quantum dot, but you do not. And this is really, an extension of uh, of Ehrenfest's uh, theorem that you only see the average. So you see the what you see is the center of mass system, really. So first, voila! Here is the harmonic potential theorem proven or simulated for a one-dimensional quantum dot, and you see that for a system with two particles, four, six, eight, ten, and twelve all of them have the same frequency. So the only difference between these simulations is the number of electrons we add to them. So how we did these simulations, we excited the system with a, a laser field of resonant frequency with the system. So we're able to excite it, the system, and then we just let the system propagate in time or develop in time for a very long time. We compute the, uh, the dipole moment of uh, the system for for each of these time steps, and then at the end we compute the Fourier transform to get the frequency spectrum, which is, which is the, the energy transitions, really. So this is uh, comparable to a, a, an emission spectrum. And the, it's, the results are quite uh, neat. Here are the same res kind of result for a two-dimensional quantum dot for two, six, and twelve uh, particles. And you see we are also here, except perhaps for this, uh, which is it's still fairly close to one. But I think this is because the, the basis set is a bit small. So what if we add a magnetic field? And we do this by adding a angular momentum operator to the Hamiltonian. Thing is, with the magnetic field, what will happen in a quantum dot is that you will increase the energy of some states relative to the others and decrease the energy of some other states, depending on their magnetic quantum number. So here you see a, uh, how the, the generis would add up. So uh, here is the um, the cyclotron frequency corresponding to the strength of the magnetic field rel relative to the um, the oscillator frequency of the quantum dot, right? And here is the energy or the energy of the states on the the y-axis. So if we have zero magnetic field, we get the degenerates like this in two dimensions. We're in two dimensions. So this 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 is the common common shell structure in two dimensions. We have one ground state energy and then a truly degenerate uh, state and then three, four, and so on. But you see, as we progress, we shift some energies up, some down, and, and we get new shell structures, right? But if you didn't really get this, the, the takeaway is that uh, when you add a magnetic field to an electronic system, you will uh, shift some states up in energies and some states down relative to the others. Here are some nice results. So what we have done the same thing here. We have a two-dimensional quantum dot and we add a static homogeneous man magnetic field uh, and we uh, excite the system with a laser pulse. We let it develop in time and then we uh, compute the Fourier transform and we do this 
and we vary the strength of the magnetic field. And you see that, and you see that very interestingly, the difference in the two frequencies we now measure, because some states are shifted up and some are down, is the same as the frequency of the magnetic field that we subject the systems to here. 0.5 in cyclotron frequency, i.e. the strength of the magnetic field, and 0.5 difference. And same here, 0. well, almost. So these are for two particles, and the results remain the same also for four electrons. And that's when I ran out of uh, computational resources on the uh, computing cluster at the University of Oslo, and it's the end of my, my talk. What we are really proud of is that we've been able to develop electronic systems in time, larger systems than ever before and more accurate than ever before. So we are hoping for a few, at least one publication in my, my case. Thank you. I hope you like this and I hope it wasn't too too difficult or too technical. When you have been doing something for, for a year and a half, it is a bit difficult to, to try to make it accessible for everyone. But I, I hope that this was uh, interesting and really gave an insight into what I've been doing for well, the past year and a half. Thank you very much. Bye.